Well, good evening, everyone. I'm just take, taking my mask off temporarily so you can hear me. A uh, great pleasure to welcome tonight our speaker, Dr. Sharon Leach. Um, uh, Sharon is uh, both a practicing G general practitioner uh, and an academic uh, university, a PhD university academic. Uh, so she is going to talk tonight about uh, perhaps one of her forebears, uh, Dr. Margaret Cruikshank. <laughs> Sharon, thank you. Tina Koto Katoa, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Oh, actually, yeah. there we go. Perhaps you can hear a little bit more easily now. No? I've got this turned on. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. Anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. This lecture was first delivered as part of the University of Otago Great Scott series in October 2019, and more recently uh, at the U3A group uh, here in Dunedin. So apologies if any of you have heard it before, uh, but it's a very interesting story and um, I hope that you enjoy it. Today's lecture is on the remarkable life and legacy of Dr. Margaret Barnett Cruikshank, the first woman to attain medical registration and work as a general practitioner in New Zealand. Firstly, we'll examine her early life, then I'll outline a brief history of women in medicine to help you understand how, how remarkable her achievement was. Finally, I'll talk about the impact of the women medical pioneers on doctors today. Both of Margaret's parents were born in Aberdeen. Her father, George Cruikshank, was a stonemason by trade, but left Scotland at the age of 25 to seek his fortune on the gold fields, firstly in Australia, and then sailed on to the Otago gold fields a year later, arriving in Dunedin in 1863. George maintained a lengthy correspondence with a young lady from home, Margaret Taggart, for about nine years before she followed him out to New Zealand. When she finally arrived, the couple married at Knox Church in February 1872 and initially lived at Waikawaiti before settling on a 90-acre farm called Riverbanks near Palmerston in the Shag River Valley. The first of their children were born at Waikawaiti on New Year's Day in 1873. They were twin girls and in the Scottish tradition were named after their grandmothers Margaret Barnett and Christina Murray. George and Margaret Cruikshank had another five children over the following decade, including another set of twins. No doubt weakened by the rigours of farm life and her large family, Margaret unfortunately died seven weeks under her, after her youngest child was born. Her death was attributed to puerperal fever. Margaret was aged 44 and her eldest twin daughters were just 10 years old. The baby was cared for by another woman, Mrs Simpson, and was returned to the family when she was two years old. Following the death of their mother, the twins Margaret and Christina took on much of the burden caring for their younger siblings. The girls took turns attending primary school one twin would mind the children, while the other twin would attend school and teach her sister what she'd learnt each evening. It must have been a very effective strategy because the twins did exceptionally well. They attended Palmerston District High School, then won Education Board scholarships, which paid for their tuition at Otago Girls High School. The girls were joint ducks of Otago Girls High School in 1891. That same year, Margaret and Christina each won a New Zealand University Junior Scholarship, winning two of the 12 scholarships that were awarded that year, and both attended Otago University. Christina Cruikshank gained a Master of Arts and Master of Science and became a teacher, eventually becoming principal of Wanganui Girls College. Margaret attended the University of Otago Medical School, graduating in 1897 with first-class honours and prizes in medicine, clinical medicine, midwifery and diseases of women, 
and first class honours in surgery, medical jurisprudence and public health. Margaret was the second woman in New Zealand to graduate with a medical degree a year behind her friend Emily Seiderberg, but was the first New Zealand trained woman to become registered with the Medical Council and the first female general practitioner. In 1903 she was awarded the higher qualification of MD, the Doctor of Medicine. Let's take a step back from Dr Crookshank to place her achievement in context. Women have been caring for others probably since the beginning of human life. However, they've had to fight very hard to enter the world of modern medicine as doctors. For centuries, medicine was firmly situated in the male world of universities, well out of reach of women who were usually forbidden to attend. Higher education for women was considered potentially dangerous as it was thought to result in physical deformities and weaken the human race. Um, I'm sorry, the... The slides aren't... Oh, there we go. Oops, they've all come in. There we go, right. Professor Edward Clark, an American gynaecologist, published a book in 1873 on the education of girls. He believed that educating females was unwise, as it, um, sorry, I'm just trying to make that little screen dis disappear. Could move that out of the way, that would be lovely. He believed educating females was unwise as it resulted in monstrous brains and puny bodies, abnormally active cerebration and abnormally weak digestion, flowing thought and constipated bowels. He advised girls should spend less time studying than boys and should also avoid study during menstruation. This early cartoon from Zurich depicts women students as deformed myopic hags uh, in the picture above, compared to the lovely ladies that they could have been if only they had abstained from mental exertion. Closer to home, doctors Truby King, famous of course for establishing Plunkett, and Ferdinand Batchelor, who was a renowned obstetrician and gynaecologist, led a campaign against higher education for women, giving talks such as the effect of advanced education of women on the vitality of the race. They opposed education for girls after puberty, apart from that relating to housekeeping and child rearing, and were instrumental in establishing the Otago University School of Home Science in 1911. The main aim of these courses is to provide a thoroughly scientific education for women and the principles underlying the conduct and organisation of home life in order to equip them well and adequately for the part that they have to play. If women were considered unfit for higher education in general, they were considered absolutely physically and emotionally unsuitable to study medicine. The flourishing study of anatomy in the 17th and 18th centuries, of course by men, had found the female physique lacking. The German anatomist Theo Theodor von Bischoff published a 56 page book in 1872 called The Study and Practice of Medicine by Women, in which he argued that women's smaller brain, her physical weakness and gentle nature, made her unfit to study medical science. The human body was too immodest and unseemly a subject for women to examine, and perhaps most damning of all, in competing with men, women were thought to be rejecting their female natures, and like Lady Macbeth, were somehow unsexed. The Edinburgh University magazine of February 1871 discussed the issue of women medical students, stating, let us here state our firm belief it is a sign not of an advancing, but of a decaying civilization where women force themselves into competition with the other sex. All around the world, women who sought places at medical school were maligned in their efforts and faced opposition and rejection at every turn. Around this time, Sir William Osler, the putative father of mod modern medicine, is reported to have said, humanity is divided into three classes, 
men, women, and women physicians. Let's take a moment to consider the key pioneering medical women. The very earliest female doctor that we know of is Margaret Ann Bulkley, who was born in 1795. Although looking back from today's time, I'm not sure this doctor actually would have self-identified as female. With the blessing of her family, uh, they lived as a man, James Barry, in order to train and practice medicine. Dr. Barry became a highly respected surgeon in the British Army, and it was only following Dr. Barry's untimely death of dysentery was their sex and identity revealed to the very great consternation of the British Army, who buried their distinguished surgeon as a man. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman to be permitted to attend medical school in 1847. The Dean of the Geneva Medical College in New York, where she trained, faced a huge backlash from the medical community and rapidly forbade any subsequent medical student, uh, female students, stating, Miss Blackwell's admission was an experiment not intended as a precedent. A handful of American women managed to obtain medical degrees around that time, but by the mid-1850s, few if any woman could find a position at medical school in America and they were forced to travel abroad to obtain a medical education, usually to France and Switzerland, uh, which is where the cartoon we saw earlier was published. Although these countries permitted women to attend medical school, women's high school education across Europe was seldom rigorous enough to actually qualify. The first English woman to be openly permitted to practice medicine was Elizabeth Garrett Anderson in 1865. She achieved this through a legal loophole in the admissions process um, and trained through the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, which then qualified her for further formal medical education. Suffice to say that loophole was rapidly closed to bar other women from entering the profession. Probably the most internationally influential group came from Scotland, known as the Edinburgh Seven or Seven Against Edinburgh. These were seven young women who enrolled to study medicine at the University of Edinburgh in 1869. They faced substantial resistance from both their male peers and medical teachers, leading to the infamous Surgeons Hall riot in 1870. On the way to an anatomy exam, the seven women had to pass by a crowd of several hundred men who were shouting and jeering. They had mud and rubbish thrown at them, and they were locked out of the examination hall. A fellow student took pity on them and unlocked the door, but once they were inside, someone set loose a live sheep. Despite this and many other hardships, they all completed the medical course and passed their exams, often at the top of their class. However, the seven were prohibited from graduating and qualifying as doctors. The seven women, Mary Anderson, Emily Bovell, Matilda Chaplin, Helen Evans, Sophia Jex Blake, Edith Peachy and Isabel Thorne, were awarded posthumous honorary Bachelor of Medicine degrees in July 2019, 150 years after their admission. However, all was not lost. The publicity of the Surgeon's Hall riot and general poor treatment of the Edinburgh Seven led to a breakthrough. The UK Medical Act of 1876 was passed, allowing all qualified applicants, regardless of gender, to obtain a medical licence in the UK. A women's medical school was opened in Edinburgh in 1886, and Glasgow Queen Margaret College offered women medical courses from 1890. So what was happening in Dunedin? The University of Otago opened in July 1869. Thanks to the ardent petitioning of Miss Learmonth Dalrymple, who had been extremely instrumental in the establishment of Otago Girls High School, the University Council voted unanimously in August 1871 to admit women and was the first university in Australasia to do so. Although the university had been open to women almost from the start, the medical school was quite a different story. Otago Medical School officially opened in 1875. 
Initially there was just a two year course available and then students were required to travel to Edinburgh to complete their studies. Following the experiences of the Edinburgh Seven, the women were forbidden from attending Edinburgh Medical School and therefore they were also not permitted to commence the course here in Dunedin. However, by 1883, Otago University was operating a complete medical course and the University Council could find no suitable objection to prevent women from studying medicine. Now at this time, the school was barely uh, financially viable at least partly due to lack of students and closure of the medical school was debated. Despite this, the admission of women was not welcomed by staff, students or local doctors. This is Dunedin Hospital's um, Campbell Pavilion, erected in 1883. Six of the nine Dunedin Hospital doctors wanted to exclude women students their opposition was overruled, fortunately, by the lay members of the Dunedin Hospital Trust, stating they could see no objection to women attending the usual medical course. Emily Siderberg commenced her medical studies in 1891, and Margaret Cruikshank started the following year. In 1891, the student periodical, The University Review, held a debate as to whether women should attend medical school. A local doctor contributed to the debate, writing, Why should a woman unsex herself by giving way to a morbid craving which can only be likened to an epidemic of insanity? Medical school staff were particularly concerned with the propriety of teaching co-educational classes. The head of the medical school, Professor Scott, and other lecturers uh, requested that women leave the class from time to time. Dr Eleanor Bacon McLagan, the sixth woman to attend Otago Medical School, recounted an occasion where a lecturer stopped the class and demanded that the two women present leave. She recalled, he said, I now come to the part of my lectures that I refuse to give before women, therefore the woman must leave the room or I will leave it. So covered with blushes and confusion and accompanied by a thunder of hoots, Jeers and stamping, the two women hurriedly collected their things and got out. Of course, later they had to go round to the men and copy their notes. Years later, Professor Scott was reported to say, women are getting through medicine with much less contamination than one would have believed possible. Neither Emily Siderberg nor Margaret Cruikshank complained about their time at medical school, but others paint a grim picture. A Miss Tracy had apparently commenced medical school in 1890, the year before Emily Siderberg, but was reportedly hounded out due to lack of support from the teaching staff. In those early days, there was an anatomy room assistant called Woolly Godlet. He was often chased around by medical students, wielding an arm or a leg, and on more than one occasion, he was stripped to his undergarments, strapped to a gurney beside a cadaver, and locked in the dissection room. He thought nothing of such things, merely that the lads had high spirits and were larking about. However, of women medical students, Woolley had this to say, they did not want lady doctors and the lady students had to thank Miss Siderberg for her pluck in making way for them. The young men would throw the flesh at her every chance they got. This type of behaviour was corroborated by later medical students. Woolley stated that he had to have a special wash prepared for Miss Siderberg in case she had flesh thrown in the face. However, Emily Siderberg stated she only experienced any trouble on one occasion and Professor Scott quickly took stern disciplinary action, ensuring that this was not repeated. Similarly, Margaret Cruikshank took pains to state how civil her training and clinical experience had been when speaking years later to a reporter from The White Ribbon the magazine of the New Zealand Women's Christian Temperance Movement. She said, Both in my student and professional life, I have met with nothing but kindness, courtesy and help from my teachers and brother practitioners, and I hope that I may never give them cause to treat me otherwise. On graduating, it was not easy for women to find employment as a doctor. No state employments were considered suitable 
for women prior to the establishment of the St Helens Maternity Hospitals in 1905, at least in part due to a lack of doctor's accommodation. Private practice was really the main option available, but this required substantial capital at a time when banks would not lend money to women, and it was very risky due to the general lack of acceptance of women doctors. Dr Cruikshank gained employment as an associate GP and later a practice partner for Dr H.C. Barclay, a GP in Waimati. This appointment was attributable to the very strong recommendation of her former teacher at Otago Girls High School, Miss McLean, who was now Mrs Scott, uh, who had married a, a wealthy Waimati landowner and was now a very important person in the community. Dr Cruikshank's appointment was regarded as an experiment amongst the medical community and Waimati residents were initially apprehensive at the thought of having a woman doctor. On the announcement of her appointment, a report from the Omaru Mail uh, reported Dr Cruikshank's excellence at medical school and goes on to say, after such a distinguished academic career, it is certainly a matter of interest that Dr Cruikshank should have settled in our midst. The day of the lady doctor, like the women's franchise and the labour legislation, seems to be upon us. And we cannot do less than wish this clever pioneer much happiness and success in the career that she has selected. Dr Cruikshank's skill, common sense, humility and dedication to the job soon won over those who doubted her capacity. Mr Chris Hansen was born in 1870 and lived in Waimati his whole life. He remembered, she thought nothing of walking three or four miles and would often roll up her sleeves and help a poor housewife with her work. You had to have money for doctors and chemists in those days, but most people couldn't afford treatment. As far as Dr Cruikshank was concerned, if you could pay, you did. And if you could not, you were never summonsed. Another local, Miss Margaret Smart, recalled it's no exaggeration to say that each passing year brought Dr Cruikshank more affection. Elderly, young, rich and poor alike welcomed her coming. She became the confidant of many, with her advice and sympathy being sought in domestic affairs, financial difficulties, as well as with intimate personal problems. Being a GP in those days meant house calls by day, delivering babies by night and caring for patients at the Waimati District Hospital uh, that you can see in the picture here. As well as her GP work, Dr Cruikshank both anaesthetised and operated on patients and she also ran first aid classes for ladies. Looking back, the diagnostic tools and treatments that were available at the turn of the last century now appear hopelessly primitive. Likewise, the pharmacopoeia of the time was extremely limited and many critically important medicines hadn't been discovered yet, including antibiotics, insulin and antihypertensives. I could go on and on. The medical school purchased its first microscope in 1896 and first x-ray machine around 1903. Waimati got its first x-ray machine in 1911. Gloves were not in routine use until the early 1900s. Sea sponges were still used as swabs in surgery. It seems incredible that anyone survived medical and surgical treatments at all. Despite the limitations of the time, Dr Cruikshank served the community of Waimati faithfully for over 20 years, only taking one year off. In 1913 she travelled to Canada, Edinburgh and Dublin with her younger sister Isabel for further training. Before she left, the community presented her with a purse containing 100 sovereigns and a fine gold watch and chain, which you can see today at the, uh, at the Waimati Museum. On the presentation, many people spoke of her sincerity of purpose, her sense of humour, her freedom from pretense, her capacity for loyal friendship, her dependability, her gentleness, patience and unselfishness. And the generous impulses of this truly womanly woman, whose splendid example had made all those present largely her debtors. Margaret returned to Waimati early in 1914. Once home, her colleague Dr Barclay left, intending to take 18 months of leave, but then he joined the war effort with the Royal Army Medical Corps. Margaret was also involved in the war effort fundraising for the Red Cross. 
A fundraising Queen Carnival was held and Dr Crookshank was enthusiastically supported as the Waimati Queen. A friend wrote, she seemed to appear to us in a different guise that evening as she stood tall and gracious in her beautiful court dress of satin and lace, her fair hair with its glint of gold arranged in a coronet. Margaret confessed she hardly recognised herself in such festive garb. Dr Crookshank ran the practice single-handedly with care and aplomb during the war years. She would mostly cycle or travel by horse and buggy to visit her patients, and later on, when roads allowed, she used this motor car. Dr Crookshank even cared for one of my own relations during this time, signing the death certificate of one James Mickelson, the first cousin of my great-grandmother, who died of tuberculosis aged only 32. The real medical challenge came after the war. The returning troops brought a deadly strain of influenza back home. The strain of influenza was known by many names, but Spain was the only country publishing detailed reports of the epidemic, so the name Spanish flu stuck. The Niagara troopship pictured here is often attributed as the source of the deadly new flu virus, but it's more likely the disease was dispersed throughout the troops and no one single ship can be blamed. The troops arrived home in October 1918, and within two to four weeks, the epidemic was at its peak. It was a truly dreadful disease. People with the illness would deteriorate rapidly, sometimes collapsing within hours and dying on the first day of being unwell. Those that survived could be severely unwell for several weeks before they recovered. The flu caused a severe pneumonia with swelling and fluid on the lungs, which meant people rapidly lost the ability to breathe. A doctor described seeing these patients literally choking to death with pulmonary edema, the lungs so swamped with blood, foam and mucus that the faces were grey, the lips purple, and each desperate breath was like the quacking of a duck. The disease spread quickly from person to person, aided by the close living in soldiers' barracks, armistice celebrations, people meeting for zinc sulphate inhalation, which was used quite ineffectively for both prophylaxis and treatment, and a very slow public health response to restricting travel and quarantine measures. By mid-November, the country was basically completely shut down. Most businesses and factories were too short-staffed to open, and schools, churches, pubs and the theatres were closed by order of the government. It's estimated that 30 to 50 per cent of the population was infected. Doctors and nurses laboured on. In Dunedin, the medical students played their part. Junior, doctors, uh, sorry, junior students served as nurses and ambulance officers, while senior medical students were promoted to doctors and were even permitted to sign medical uh, death certificates. And of course, Margaret Crookshank continued working to the point of exhaustion. Waimati Hospital was overflowing with critically ill patients. Two marquees were set up on the lawn to house the extras. Dr Crookshank tried to keep as many patients in their homes as possible. Her housekeeper's son, MJ Leonard, recalled those days. Where the mother was laid low, Dr Crookshank fed the baby, prepared the meal, and in many cases, where whole families were laid low, she would milk the family cow to obtain milk for their sustenance. Mary Munn was just 12 years old and had to care for her whole family who was sick with the flu. She said Dr Crookshank came every day, and after she had been, mysterious parcels would be found left at the back door. These always contained the type of food necessary to sick people, and the kind a 12-year-old was capable of preparing. Another local recounted one of Dr Crookshank's visits to a man unwell with the flu. She went to one place and found she'd left, left her stethoscope in the buggy, so she put her ear to this man's chest and she told him to count out loud while she listened to his lungs. So she started off, one, two, three, four, and so on, and she fell sound asleep. She woke up to hear him still going, 997, 998. I think he was one of the survivors. There weren't very many funny stories like this one. It was a terrible time. 
Finally, Dr Cruikshank caught the flu herself and succumbed to pneumonia on November the 28th, 1918. Waimiti was bereft. Although no, there was no public funeral allowed due to the pandemic, businesses closed and people gathered all along the streets of Waimiti to witness the good doctor's passing. Around 20% of those that contracted the flu died from it. Worldwide, about 20 million people died from the flu, more than double those who had died in World War I. 8,573 New Zealanders died, including 37 nurses and 14 doctors, at a time when the total population was just 1.1 million. The Māori population was particularly hard hit with a much higher death rate compared to other ethnicities. The flu was unusual in that um, younger people were hardest hit with a peak mortality rate between 20 and 40 years old. In comparison, in a normal flu season, around 500 New Zealanders die from the influenza each year, and these are mainly older folk. So what has been the impact of Dr Cruikshank and those pioneering medical women? The numbers of women in medicine have massively increased over the years. Dr Margaret Cruikshank graduated in 1897. 100 years later, I was a second year medical student commencing my journey in a class of nearly 200. 56% of my class were women. And you can see from the graph that it took a very long time for the proportion of women in medicine to increase. By the 1950s, women accounted for just 10% of the class. In the 60s, 12.5%, and by the early 70s, this was 17%. More women than men have graduated from Otago Medical School every year since 2005. This graph is of Otago graduates. The same gender pattern is repeated in medical schools throughout the Western world. What has been the impact of increasing numbers of women in medicine? Initially it was considered abnormal to challenge women's rightful place in society. The feminist publication The Women's Journal in 1884 reported male physicians complaining, nurses are docile, submissive and keep their proper place. Once let a woman study medicine and she thinks her opinion is as good as a man. The concept of woman doctor became more accepted over time, but even in the 1970s, women doctors were still considered a bit odd. In 1971, the feminist icon Germaine Greer wrote, a girl who studies medicine will qualify if she works hard enough, but it's true that women patients prefer male doctors, and so do men. Fortunately, the world has moved on. Women are accepted in all domains of medicine. Even traditionally male-dominated fields such as surgery, orthopaedics and urology now have female clinicians and trainees. This is beautifully depicted by the social media movement hashtag I look like a surgeon which started in 2015 aiming to increase diversity and was popularised in 2017 when this iconic artwork by Malika Favre featured on the cover of the New Yorker magazine. Since then, many hundreds of women surgeons have imitated her artwork and published it online. Uh, and you can see a sample here. Increasing numbers of women have meant increasing flexibility for training programs. For allow example, allowing time off for parental leave and part-time work. These programs recognise the great value of having women in their ranks. Also, men are less satisfied with this traditional status quo and seek more involvement in their families and better work-life balance than clinicians from previous generations. However, true gender equality has not yet been obtained, with women doctors still underrepresented in senior health leadership positions and academic roles, and are still typically paid less than men. It will be interesting to see whether this changes over time now the majority of women medical graduates, uh, the majority of medical graduates are women. Women and men bring different strengths to medicine and patients cared for by women do at least as well as those cared for by men, if not better. Women and men have different communication styles with women typically rated as more empathetic and more patient-centred than their male colleagues. 
These differences are most obvious in reviews of patient complaints where male clinicians are vastly overrepresented. In a recent Australian study, 79% of complaints were made against male doctors. Women provide more preventative care and are more likely to follow clinical guidelines. Most interestingly, a 2017 study felt that elderly hospitalised patients cared for by women doctors had lower 30-day readmission and lower 30-day mortality rates compared to those cared for by men. However, it's not all bread and roses. Women clinicians have been accused of exacerbating healthcare shortages due to longer consultation times, with consequently less appointments available per day. Career interruptions for parental leave, higher rates of part-time work, and bearing a greater burden of home responsibilities all impinge on clinical contact time and may reduce the amount of continuity of care provided. Female GPs may use more healthcare resources as they are more likely to order tests and refer patients on to secondary care. There is no doubt that the face of medicine has vastly changed over the past 150 years and no doubt that Dr Margaret Crookshank and her pioneering female colleagues had a huge impact on the entrance and acceptance of women into medicine. Dr Crookshank has been honoured in many ways. Waimati residents rightly thought of Dr Margaret Crookshank as something of a saint. In 1923, the community erected a 3.3 tall Italian marble statue in her honour. She's dressed in academic robes and holds the Bible in her left hand, representing her strong Christian faith. The inscription reads, The beloved physician, faithful unto death. This statue is one of the few in New Zealand celebrating a woman. Dr Crookshank was also commemorated in the naming of the Margaret Crookshank Ward, the maternity ward of the Waimati Area Hospital, and nowadays the Crookshank Wing of Lister Home in Waimati accommodates patients requiring rest home and hospital level care. In May 2007, the New Zealand Government held a national pandemic preparedness exercise named Operation Crookshank. This occurred over five days and involved both local and national government agencies. At the time it was New Zealand's largest exercise to have taken place. The Ministry of Health now holds these exercises regularly to try and ensure the country is better prepared for the next international pandemic. And I'm sure New Zealand's outstanding response to COVID is at least partly attributable to these exercises. In 2014, Otago Girls High School established a school health system and named one of the four houses Crookshank. In 2018, Artist Bill Scott painted Margaret Crookshank on one of the historic grain silos in Waimati. And on the 28th of November 2018, the Waimati branch of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists held a wonderful 100 year commemoration of Dr. Margaret Crookshank's life. She is not forgotten, and her legacy lives on. And then 1973, uh, sorry, 1963, History of the Medical School, Sir Charles Herkus and Sue Gordon Bell praised Dr Crookshank as the finest female graduate that Otago Medical School had turned out. They go on to say, we can pay no greater tribute to Otago women graduates than to say that they have shown themselves to be worthy guardians of the great heritage that their pioneer predecessors left them. The tradition goes on. And I'll finish this talk with a short poem called Progress by Rupi Kaur. Our work should equip the next generation of women to outdo us in every field. This is the legacy that we'll leave behind. Thank you. So I'm very happy to take uh, any questions um, from the audience and from our um, Zoom audience. Oh, this chat, let's have a look here. Can't hear audio. No. Um, all right. <laughs> so, uh, if anyone on Zoom wants to to put a mess, uh, a question in, in the in the chat, feel free to do so. Sharon, can, can you tell us a bit more about that episode where Dr. Crookshank dressed up as the Queen of Waimati, um, 
Um, yes, so so uh, I'll just repeat the question for those online that might not have heard it. So, uh, did Margaret Cookshank uh, participate in a beauty pageant? And I'm afraid the answer is yes, she did, but it was for a very good cause, and she looked beautiful as we all saw. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, oh, there's one up the back there, yes. Looking at the graph you have of graduates, paid graduates, and um, the two thoughts that entered my mind, one was the therapeutic revolution, but secondly, the introduction of the oral contraceptive might have made a tremendous difference to women's career prospects and, I mean, just change whatever from 1960s onwards. Yes, so um, I'm just trying to get back to that slide because that often raises a bit of discussion. Oh, here we go. So um, I'll just put up that, that graph again. Um, so, yes, I'm sure the access to the oral contraceptive did have something to do with more women going into medicine. But actually, um, around this time, uh, up until that point, there was a requirement that you had to um, pass physics at high school and most of the girls schools around the country did not have a physics teacher so um, so girls uh, at girls schools would often have to travel to the boys schools to, to study physics so it was actually very difficult to meet the prerequisites for medical school unless you, you know you were very dedicated um, before that time Any other questions? Oh, hang on, Let's, there's some on chat. Um, did any of your medical records survive? I'm not, um, so on, online someone's asked about whether the medical records survived. Um, there, there are some documents available at the um, Waimati Museum, but I can't recall off the top of my head if, if any of... Uh, there's, there's a few paraphernalia that she used. Um, I, ha I haven't read any of her medical records. Um, there's also at the Hocken um, a, a, a few parcels of um, relevant records and original documents um, with some of those photos that you've seen. So um, I haven't seen any medical records, but they may well be at Waimati. Um, that would be the place that I would check. Um, and apologies if I missed any of those questions. Any any other questions? It's not a question, it's really, really an observation and I hope I don't offend anyone. Just uh, after I saw, you know, the, the email that came from the, the, I don't know whether women missed out and not being able to join medicine because until the turn of the century from 1920th, medicine was really, I mean, just leaving aside surgery, there was nothing much to do. And in the earlier part of the century before anesthetics, I mean, in my mind, you know, to imagine a woman taking a knife onto an unanesthetized patient, I mean, that's, I just can't imagine how, you know, like to amputate someone without. I'm, I'm not a doctor, by the way. So, so, so I'll just the repeat. Best observation that passed through my yeah, sure. So, um, so just for those online, so if you didn't hear, the observation was maybe. Uh, there was not much to offer in medicine up until more recent times. Anyway, I guess the point is that. Um, there have, you know, at least for the past 150 years, there, there have been women who want to uh, become doctors, and um, I, at the time, everyone's working at their, you know, offering the latest treatments, the cutting edge treatments. Probably 150 years in the future, we'll look back. Uh, people will be horrified at the sort of treatments and things that that we are giving out today. So. Um, 
whether you know how effective some of those treatments were. I mean, it's only re retrospectively, judge, retrospectively judging is perhaps a little bit unfair, um, and it's based on that, those early knowledge that we've been able to build up to, to where medical science is today. So. Um, Personally, I think it's great that, that women were included at that point because if they weren't, you know, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to join a profession and gain um, equal status. Do you think that the right to vote um, kind of shifted how women were viewed? I mean, how does it play into things that were happening at the time? So. Yeah, sure. So the question was, um, did the right to vote um, have some impact on women getting into med school and I guess it was a time of change um, and probably did w women were perhaps starting to realise you know home and hearth wasn't the only option available um, they were the challenging boundaries and, and challenging accepted norms in other areas and I'm sure it all um, helped the cause um, there's uh, one of the comments online is um, where can we get more information to learn about this um, I'm not sure if there's a place to publish these slides online but um, there are quite a few books available in the public library and as I said um, at the, the Hocken and um, Waimati Museum it's really a, a wonderful little place to, to pop in and have a look through Great. So, and also the recording of this talk is going to be online as well. I think it just remains uh, for everyone to join me in thanking Sharon for a wonderful, really interesting talk. Thank you so much.